Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, as we look today at the settlement of the American West after the Civil War. Now, at the end of the Civil War, there were about a quarter million American Indians living in what was then called the Great American Desert. Many were nomadic Plains Indians pursuing the buffalo, but there were also many who lived settled lives, practicing agriculture, growing the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And there were many, too, who were semi-nomadic, hunting during some seasons of the year, but settling down other times. Um, and while uh, white Americans saw them all as just being Indians, they, of course, saw themselves as being many different cultures, but cultures that had the first claim on the land and its resources. Now, early on, the American government had tried to limit who could trade with the Indians and who could settle in the West, just as the British had tried to do. But um, every time that was attempted, it proved to be futile, as people wanted more land or resources like gold discovered in Indian territory. So that over time, Indians were forced onto reservations, usually on poor land, um, without ac enough access to the buffalo um, and other wild game, which many of them depended on. Furthermore, the buffalo were hunted nearly to extinction. Uh, in the late 1800s, partly by settlers who didn't want them eating their crops, partly by railroad builders who didn't want buffalo blocking the train. Because although buffalo versus train, the train's going to win, it may still get derailed. Plus, the armies of railroad builders had to be fed, and slaughtering the buffalo provided them lots of food. The hides, too, could be sold to make blankets or coats or other things. And the U.S. government, um, specifically the U.S. Army, at certain points made it policy to try to exterminate the Indians. Under General Sherman and General Sheridan, who had both tried to starve the South uh, during the Civil War, it was believed if the buffalo could be driven to extinction, maybe the Indians would starve too. Um, well, <coughs> um, of course, since the 1840s, and the idea of manifest destiny. Americans had moved across the Great Plains and through the Rockies to the West Coast. And of course, after the Civil War, many more settlers poured west, um, particularly after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. Um, and there we see them meeting at Promontory Point um, in, in Utah. Um, the, uh, the engine with the big bell-shaped smokestack being from uh, the Western Railroad in Burning Wood, the one with the straight smokestack being from the East in Burning Coal. Um, and of course the railroad and all the settlement disrupted the way of life uh, Indians had practiced for decades or centuries. Um, although the Plains Indians' nomadic lifestyle had only existed a few hundred years since they received horses from the Spanish. Um, and some Indians did fight back, but again, like all earlier efforts to resist white settlement, this failed. For one thing, they were now facing veterans of the Civil War. And uh, William Tecumseh Sherman replaced Ulysses S. Grant as commander of the U.S. Army when he became president. Sherman was later replaced by Philip Sheridan. Um, again, two generals who had been merciless against the South and were now merciless against the Indians. Sherman, sorry, Sheridan famously saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Of course, the Indians were not um, completely harmless victims. They did, too, make savage attacks on white settlers, um, killing, kidnapping, and scalping men, women, and children. Of course, if you're unfamiliar with scalping, you grab the hair on the top of someone's head, get a good sharp knife, and just slip it under. The top of their head will pop right off. You can even dry it as a souvenir. Typically, a person who is scalped will die of shock or blood loss or disease, although some people did survive. Here is a man um, who was scalped at the age of 14, um, but lived for decades afterwards. Although, as you can see, um, his hair never grew back. Um, <coughs> So there was violence on both sides, all from the Indians' point of view, it was to defend the land where they had lived for generations. Um, and fighting took place in different places at different times. Dur during the Civil War, there was tension in Colorado between American settlers and the Cheyenne. The main newspaper of Denver 
printed a front page editorial calling for the extermination of the Red Devils. Told its readers, take a few months off and dedicate that time to wiping out the Indians. And what an essay you have to write for what I did on my summer vacation. The territorial government had a policy of shooting Indians on sight. Um, and this would, understandably, eventually break out into open warfare, known as the Colorado War of 1864-65, to 65, between the Colorado Territory and the Cheyenne Indians, or at least one faction of the Cheyenne. As was so often the case, the Cheyenne had multiple factions, some who wanted to maintain peace, others who wanted to fight. Among those who wanted to fight were a group known as the Dog Soldiers, um, who, besides having quite the hairdo, traditionally wore a very long breech cloth, which is the, a long strip of cloth that you kind of tie around your um, tie around your middle parts to cover up uh, your private parts. The long it, and it kind of hangs down like a towel held by a belt. The dog soldiers would wear a very long breech cloth so the back end dragged the ground. During battle, they would take an arrow and stick it through that piece of cloth, um, kind of packing themselves to the ground to symbolically demonstrate they wouldn't run. Um, at least that was the tradition. And the dog soldiers and other Cheyenne and some other Indians, such as the Arapaho, fought against the settlers of Colorado because some wanted to make peace. The peace faction of the Cheyenne was led by a chief named Black Kettle. Um, <coughs> And he even reached an agreement with the U.S. Army, um, where the U.S. Army promised not to attack uh, his particular camp. They even gave him a big American flag and said, fly this, and your town will not be attacked. But some of the Colorado militia officers said that deals between the U.S. government uh, and the Indians, not the Colorado government. Um, the mo and so... Uh, Colorado continued to attack Indian towns and camps. For one thing, this is during the Civil War, and the draft was going on. But if you were in a territorial militia, you were exempt from the draft because you were doing your military duty. A lot of men in Colorado would rather have stayed and fought the Cheyenne close to home rather than having to go east and fight General Lee in Virginia. Um, one officer in the Colorado militia was Colonel John Shivington. And men under his command would carry out the most infamous attack of the uh, Colorado War, um, known as the Sand Creek Massacre. Sand Creek was the uh, winter camp of Black Kettle and his followers. Hearing that the uh, Colorado militia were approaching, he raised a huge white flag and raised the huge American flag he had been given by U.S. Army officers, promising to leave his camp alone. Again, the Colorado militia ignored that um, and went in and began to massacre the people of Sand Creek, most of them women and children and old men. Most of the young men were either off fighting or off hunting, depending whether they wanted to fight or not. Um, Black Kettle himself survived, but some of his family and many others were killed, and the Colorado militia were there for revenge. Um, they, in turn, scout Indians. Um, and cut off other body parts for souvenirs, um, making hat bands um, out, of, uh, out of women's uteruses. To, how you do that, I'm not sure, but it sounds unpleasant. Making tobacco pouches out of men's testicles. You're not the souvenir I would choose, but maybe it was a different time. Um, and this united many Indians against Coloradans, and also turned many Americans against Indian warfare, especially when the details of the Coloradans' atrocities got out. Indeed, some people in the East said, who is the savage? And for a time, Colorado was fighting a defensive war, with towns and even forts being raided, before eventually the Cheyenne did pull back into Nebraska to fight another day. Eventually, under the leadership of a chief known as Roman Nose, um, <coughs> And, for, and he was very successful because, although not pictured here, he had a magic war bonnet, which protected him from the bullets of white soldiers as long as he lived a pure Indian life and avoided, among other things, white technology. But it happened that 
shortly before the Battle of Beecher Island broke out, September 17, 1868. He had eaten some meat that had been cooked with an iron fork. And American Indians had never really learned to work metal very much. An iron fork had clearly come from a white trader. And so he didn't want to go into battle until he was able to pur purify himself from having used something cooked with a white fork. Um, but as the battle started to go bad, he felt he had to go into battle. Um, and his war bonnet failed him, and he was shot, um, leading a charge against the U.S. Army. And this battle was part of a campaign by Philip Sheridan to crush the Cheyenne. Um, along with Sheridan, one of the many officers under his command, was another Civil War veteran, George Custer, who at one point was sent um, with his men, the 7th Cavalry, to attack um, Cheyenne warriors in their winter camps along the Washita River, where there was a fierce battle. Um, as Indian men began to fall, um, Indian women picked up their guns and began to fight too, which from the point of view of Custer's men at least, gave them an excuse to shoot down women and children too, but whether they were armed or unarmed. In the Battle of Washita, um, Black Kettle and his wife, who had escaped the massacre at Sand Creek, were now killed. Some of the Cheyenne did escape, though, um, and some of Custer's men rode off to try to find them and never came back. Um, and Custer made no effort to find his men who had gone missing, um, which, uh, <coughs> which angered a lot of other soldiers in the U.S. Army, feeling Custer had not taken care of the men under his command. And some years later, when Custer would find himself in a tight spot, some of the officers who remembered the Washita would not hurry up to help him, um, specifically when he was fighting the Sioux, because the Cheyenne were largely defeated after Sheridan's campaign in 1868. In a another tribe, one of the largest in the plains, were the Sioux, who had actually not started off as plains Indians, but had once lived in Minnesota before being pushed out of Minnesota by the U.S. in the 1850s and early 1860s. They were temporarily defeated in 1862. Thirty-eight of their warriors were hanged in the largest mass execution in U.S. history um, at Fort Schnelling in what's now Minneapolis. Um, next time you're in Minneapolis, you can visit Fort Schnelling, although some American Indians feel it shouldn't be preserved as an historic site. From there, the, shot, the Sioux were pushed into the Dakotas, um, but continued to fight the U.S. Army off and on throughout the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. <coughs> um, during one of these conflicts in 1866, um, American soldiers um, well, fought against a Sioux leader known as Red Cloud. Uh, in one case, Red Cloud's warriors were surrounding a fort along the Powder River. Um, and reinforcements were sent towards that fort, led by Captain William Fetterman. But Red Cloud laid a trap for them, um, stationing men behind hills along the only road to the fort. He sent a few scouts out to shoot a couple shots at Fetterman's men and then run off. Fetterman pursued them into a narrow valley. And there, once all his men were in the valley, Red Cloud's men came up over both sides, charged down, and slaughtered every single one of them. Um, when one soldier who'd been killed um, had his dog picked up by an American Indian wanting to keep it as a pet, Red Cloud shot the dog. Not even an American dog could survive. But despite the massacre of Fetterman and his men, Red Cloud soldiers were never able to, uh, never able to actually take the fort um, and were eventually defeated, pushed onto reservations based around the Black Hills in southwestern South Dakota and some other areas in the plains, too. Uh, <coughs> and they were promised the Black Hills forever, those being sacred to the Sioux people. Except, in the mid-1870s, gold was discovered in the Black Hills. Um, at first, the U.S. Army was ordered to keep American settlers out of the Black Hills, and miners and explorers or anybody. But clearly something had to be done. And so Ulysses S. Grant, who by the standards of presidents um, in the 1800s was relatively sympathetic to American Indians, even briefly appointing an American Indian head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Grant tried to offer them a deal. 
he offered $25,000 to the Sioux to leave the Black Hills and move to Oklahoma. To which different factions among the Sioux had three different responses. Some said, if we don't take the money, they're going to come in and drive us out anyway. Let's just take the money and go and get it over with. Others said, maybe we should take the money, but we want more. And others said, this area is sacred to us. We should not sell it at any price. And so, um, the Sioux did not accept the offer of $25,000. Grant said they'd had their chance and told the Army to stop um, evicting white settlers from the Black Hills, effectively opening the Black Hills up to a gold rush. And the Sioux fought back. And it's known as the Great Sioux War. <coughs> Especially under the leadership um, of a military and religious leader known as Sitting Bull. Um, and uh, another military leader known as Crazy Horse. Um, the, uh, I mean, there's a lot of fighting in kind of um, eastern Montana, the western Dakotas, um, most famously along the Little Bighorn River, where George Custer was aware there was a camp um, of the Sioux and other Indians working with them. But based on um, partly bad information from local Indian agents who didn't want to admit they had no idea where the Indians were. And due to his own arrogance and refusal to believe Indian scouts working for him, um, Custer thought there weren't too many Indians encamped in there um, and led about 250 men uh, into the camp along the Little Bighorn River, um, where in fact there were far more Indians than he expected. On July 25th, 1876, in the Battle of the Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, he and about half the men in the 7th Cavalry, including two of his brothers, um, were killed by the Sioux and other Indians. Uh, not the very worst defeat of the U.S. Army by American Indians, but one of the worst, one that shocked the country, and one that was romanticized throughout the rest of the 1800s as Custer's widow and Wild West shows told the story as one of Custer being a hero and a martyr, rather than presenting him um, as having made a pretty disastrous mistake. Um, in the mid-20th century, historians would review Custer's decisions and come to the conclusion he had, in fact, been an idiot. Um, and Custer was pretty widely reviled for most of the late 20th century. Today, some historians have looked back yet again and suggested it was more complex. And even if Custer had done poorly here, he had been a very effective commander in other cases. Um, but he was seen as a hero and a martyr for the late 1800s and much of the early 20th century. But <coughs> despite this big victory for the Sioux, um, it wasn't enough. More soldiers went in, and the Sioux were defeated in 1877, losing the Black Hills um, and being restricted to smaller reservations. Now in the Pacific Northwest, um, primarily eastern Washington, west and in Idaho, the Nez Perce Indians had uh, always been friendly to the United States ever since helping Lewis and Clark on their way west. And as a tribe who was not hostile, the Nez Perce had been promised the right to live um, in Idaho and northeastern Oregon, um, starting in 1873. Of course, had lived there for who knows how long before. But in 1877, the U.S. government changed its mind, decided to reduce the reservation of the Nez Perce, ordered those living in uh, northeastern Oregon to move to Idaho. Uh, <coughs> and although one of the Nez Perce's primary leaders, Chief Joseph, told the U.S. general in, in that place, Oliver Otis Howard, that he didn't think the Great Spirit Chief gave one kind of man the right to tell another kind of man what they must do, he finally agreed it would be better just to leave um, than to fight. But some of the Nez Perce did choose to fight, um, and even killed a couple white people settling in the area, at which point the Nez Perce decided they would just cut and run, that they would flee the United States for Canada. And to me it seems the easiest thing to do would have just been to let them go. I guess the point was you couldn't tell an Indian to do something and then let him do something else. Because the army, led by General Oliver Otis Howard, uh, who lost his arm in the Civil War, 
and General Nelson Miles, um, an up-and-coming Civil War veteran, pursued the Nez Perce um, through the Rocky Mountains in the winter, as the Nez Perce slowly began to starve and freeze, until finally um, surrendering uh, to General Howard. Chief Joseph sent a famous message of surrender, um, saying, I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And a Nez Perce from there were mostly sent down to Oklahoma. Um, <coughs> um, Nelson Miles would continue to fight the Indians elsewhere. And eventually rise to become the commanding general of the U.S. Army. General Howard's um, career is mostly known for uh, for helping freed slaves improve their education after the Civil War as head of the Freedmen's Bureau and founder of Howard University. Now, <coughs> in the American Southwest, particularly Arizona, but the areas around it too, the Apache had resisted white encroachment since the late 1600s um, by stealing cattle and horses, massacring isolated settlers, travelers, and miners, they were considered some of the cruelest of all Indians in their treatment of white prisoners, who they often killed or tortured to death. In return, they too were treated cruelly. The Republic of Mexico placed a bounty on Apache scalps in 1835. Um, and by the late 1870s, most Apaches had been forced onto reservations. But in 1881, 700 Apache led by Geronimo, um, left the reservation and fled into Mexico. He returned the next year um, and helped more Apache escape the reservation and then began raiding Mexican and American towns until General Nelson Miles brought in the U.S. Army um, 5,000 soldiers and thousands more local militia to hunt down Geronimo. Um, after five years, in 1886, Geronimo agreed to surrender to General Miles, along with many of his warriors, and was sent to prison in Florida. He was eventually allowed to reunite with his wives and children, even to travel a little bit, became a minor celebrity. He sold signed souvenir postcards of himself um, at the 1904 World's Fair, the same place ice cream cones were invented. But he was never allowed to return to his homeland, and did die eventually as a prisoner of the United States. And so, uh, so we, there was, um, starting in the late 1800s, increasing sympathy for American Indians, especially among people living in the urban East, who uh, had already pushed the Indians aside a couple centuries before. The most famous of these was Helen Hunt Jackson. Um, she met a Western Indian chief, Standing Bear of the Sioux Nation, who had visited Boston and other eastern cities on a speaking tour to explain how his people had been forced out of the Black Hills once gold was discovered there. She heard him speak in 1879 and began to research the history of American Indians. In 1881, 1881 she published A Century of Dishonor, describing the mistreatment of American Indians for over a century since colonial times. At her own expense, she sent a copy to every member of Congress. And many people did start to become somewhat more sympathetic to American Indians, although it was also a lot easier to be sympathetic because they were no longer a threat. By the time her book was published, all the Indians were on reservations except Geronimo, and he was on the run. Um, but it, it was felt... In, in the 1880s, and as it had often been felt, the best way for Indians and white people to get along would be if Indians would assimilate. Um, and assimilation, of course, is becoming part of a larger culture. Um, if Indians would settle down and either learn a trade or farm a small farm, the way Thomas Jefferson thought everybody ought to do. And assimilation was promoted by the Dawes Act of 1887, that being Congressman Dawes there, uh, the Dawes Act of 1887 would give every Indian man who wanted it 160 acres of land of his own, carved out of the reservation. His reservations belong to the tribe, not to individual Indians, but individual land ownership is the American way. 
So we cut up the reservations, give every man who wants it 160 acres of land. But there's a couple problems with this. For one thing, most American Indians wanted to keep living the way they had been living. They preferred a communal system of land ownership. They didn't want to be a small farmer. Second, even if they did want to have a small farm, well, 160 acres makes a really good size farm in, say, Ohio or Illinois or Indiana. Out in the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, where land is a lot drier, 160 acres of land probably won't make a very successful farm. Um, so even Indians who wanted to do this really couldn't do it effectively on the land that was offered. And finally, Part of the Dawes Act was, once all the land had been broken up and assigned to individual Indian families, if there was any left over, and there would be, that could be open to white settlement. Um, so while some Indians did take land under the Dawes Act, many tried to quietly resist it. Um, Indians were also encouraged, and occasionally forced, to attend Indian schools, of which the most famous was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, <coughs> and where they were taught um, to act and dress and speak and hopefully think like white people, as an industrial school to learn a skilled trade, the kind of trade that would have made them welcome members of the American Federation of Labor if, you know, the AFL took non-white people. Um, and some Indian families sent their children to such schools voluntarily, feeling that was the only way for them to get ahead. Others were forced to send them, essentially, as hostages. Um, and while some took to it, many of them hated it. As you can see, these uh, young men are not dressed like the traditional American Indian. They especially hated we wearing pants and shoes. Um, and also, if they spoke anything but English, they might have their mouths washed out with soap to get that dirty Indian language out of there. Now, um, as the frontier closed, some Indians on reservations began to listen to the teachings of a Paiute weatherman named Waboka, who had received, he said, visions from God, and w which combined for him some traditional Indian beliefs with elements of Christianity. Like many Indian reformers before him, he encouraged Indians to live a pure life, reject white ways of living especially alcohol, but other things too. That if Indians would live a pure life, follow his teachings, the world, the one day, they would live in an afterlife where they would be reunited with lost loved ones. And in the short run, um, the world would be soon renewed. Um, sometime soon, the uh, west of the Mississippi River, white men would vanish and the, and the buffalo would return. Um, and a big part, or one part, of his teachings uh, was uh, encouraging dancing. And dancing was part of many traditional Indian cultures and religious practices. In particular, he taught something known as the spirit dance, or the ghost dance. Part of that was wearing special shirts. And, he's, and he, or at least some ghost dance leaders, said if you wore your ghost dance shirt and had lived a pure enough life, you were immune to the bullets of white soldiers. And the idea of all the white men vanishing sounded to the U.S. Army like a conspiracy. They believed that the ghost dance movement was really a plot to rise up again against U.S. control. Um, many thought this was being led by Sitting Bull, who for a time had fled to Canada and later had returned to the U.S. as a celebrity traveling with Wild West shows, um, but had now settled on a reservation in South Dakota. He approved of the ghost dance movement, but wasn't really part of it. The Army thought he was. And December 15, 1890, um, actually sent Indians working for the reservation government to arrest him at his home. He refused to go and was shot, um, and by Indian police working for the reservation. Two weeks later, um, men from the 7th Cavalry, Custer's old unit, went to another Indian village along the Wounded Knee Creek. Um, they ordered the Indians there to put down their rifles. Um, and some did, but others refused. Um, many put on their ghost dance shirts and began dancing. Um, <coughs> because their shirts, of course, would make them immune to the soldiers' bullets. 
One Indian in particular refused to give up his gun, um, and a soldier tried to grab it. Um, but in that, he, that was his gun. He paid for it. In any case, he didn't understand English and was deaf. So even if he could have heard them, he wouldn't have known what they said. When he resisted, somebody fired a shot. Um, more shooting broke out. And pretty soon, about 200 Indians had been killed or wounded in the Battle of Wounded Knee, um, along with about 69 soldiers. Um, and many of the Indians shot were unarmed, although, although not all. Um, so many people have described this not as a battle, but as a massacre. Um, but either way, it's also viewed as the final battle of the Indian Wars. After the Battle of Wounded Knee, um, in late December 1890, there would not be another battle between the U.S. Army and American Indians. Well, <coughs> and so this did clear the way, and had been clearing the way, for white settlement. As we've already discussed, American history has always been based on expansion. A place explored, expanded, and settled in recent historical memory as famously expressed by Frederick Jackson Turner in his Frontier Thesis, um, first expressed as part of his speech, an essay, later a whole book, the significance of the frontier in American history, and, uh, first stated in 1893. And he argued that the frontier um, served a couple purposes. For one thing, he said, the frontier is where democracy had been created and recreated throughout American history. Every time people moved west, they had to start over. They had to work side by side. They had to form a government of their own. And having worked side by side in forming that government, or that society, they created a more democratic government than the society they left behind. The first states to eliminate property qualifications were states that at that point were western states. Um, and then they elected somebody, Andrew Jackson, who brought more democracy, for good or bad, to the U.S. government. As people moved further west, they further expanded democracy. The first state to allow women to vote was Wyoming, about as much of a frontier state as you could get. So every time people moved west, they created, he said, a more democratic society, which also in turn kept American democracy fresh as it was recreated generation after generation. Um, he also said the West was a safety valve and a place for people from the crowded eastern cities to go and start over, which helped to keep wages high in eastern cities, and for people who just didn't fit in the settled civilization. This gave them a place to go and live their life. One reason America was less inclined to be kind of revolutions um, that were sometimes seen in Europe. Tr Americans who didn't quite fit in had somewhere else to go. Uh, <coughs> and this thesis, the Turner thesis or frontier thesis, was very influential um, in how Americans thought of our history for decades to come. Eventually, in kind of the mid-20th century, people began to question this, pointing out that the empty land where settlers created democracy wasn't entirely empty, there being American Indians there already, who might not have voted for this if there had been full democracy. And it likewise, um, America had not, as Turner suggested, been the only country to create democracy on the frontier. Canada, um, Australia had pretty similar histories of expansion and democratization. South Africa and Brazil also expanded into frontiers at the expense of local people and created democratic but imperfectly democratic governments. And of course, Russia had a huge frontier, but not much democracy. All of Turner's now been out of fashion long enough, he's starting to be, come back into fashion. So you're allowed to like him, if you like. But, like him or not, people certainly were moving west. Um, thanks, as we've already mentioned, to the Homestead Act, passed by the Republican government of the Civil War in 1862. This gave 160 acres of land for only $18, which even in those days was not much money, to any farmer who would go there, build a house, and work the land for five years, in wanting this land to go to people who would farm it, not to land speculators who might resell it. 
<coughs> Eventually, the best land was claimed. Later homestead acts allowed the settlement of 320, eventually 640 acres of land. And you could do that up to 1976, 1986 in Alaska. Of course, some Americans had, and of course the Transcontinental Railroad, um, had also um, encouraged people to go west, or made it easier to go west. Although people had been going west ever since the discovery of gold in California. Transcontinental Railroad was built by two competing companies. The Union Pacific um, began in Omaha, Nebraska, and moved west. Many of the people working on it were recent Irish immigrants, although they were immigrants from other places, and also after, after the Civil War, many Southerners, white and black, who wanted something different. Um, they moved west. Um, under the leadership of a number of men, but most notably Thomas Durant, um, was one of the most important leaders of the Union Pacific. The Central Pacific began in Sacramento, California, and moved east, largely built um, by workers recruited um, in China and moved to the United States. When, um, when one of the four leaders, the big four, um, who ran the Central Pacific, asked another if they really wanted to hire Chinese people, said, can they really build something like this? The response was supposedly, well, they had built the Great Wall of China. And, <coughs> as I've mentioned already, the two railroads finally met at Promontory Summit in Utah, uh, a bit north of Salt Lake City. The two railroads were ceremonially connected with a golden spike um, driven into, uh, into the railroad by the leaders of the two companies, then it immediately pulled out and put in the museum so nobody could steal it. Um, these railroads were financed by huge loans from the federal government, eventually repaid, and huge grants of land from the U.S. government and state governments. Essentially, half the land alongside the railroads for a mile back was given to the railroads. The U.S. government handed over 131 million acres of land, some state governments 49 million more acres, as a reward for the railroads. And indeed, for the railroads, a lot of their money came not from shipping freight or moving passengers, um, but from real estate. Um, railroad owners grew rich, of course, building and maintaining the Transcontinental Railroad. Some got rich, too. Um, from dishonest schemes like the credit mobilia fraud. But the country was at last linked from sea to shining sea, and more transcontinental railroads were built um, in decades to come. And the railroads let many kinds of lifestyles thrive in the West. Of course, people had already gone West to mine during the California gold rush. Um, but while it's the most famous gold rush, drawing over a quarter million people to California, in just its first four years, it was far from the only great miners' rush. In 1858, gold was discovered at Pikes Peak, Colorado, leading Colorado to become a state just 18 years later. In 1859, the discovery of the Comstock Lode in Nevada created one of the most profitable mines in American history. And of course, later on, the discovery of gold in Alaska in 1896 would finally prove Seward's folly wasn't so foolish after all. Now, the myth of Western mining is that it was something for hard-working individuals or small groups to go out and find a lucky strike in the gold fields of California. Um, and sometimes that was true. But the real money was in being one of the merchants who sold overcharged, uh, overpriced goods to those miners. Um, that's how Levi Strauss sold his first blue jeans. And pretty soon, Mining, like so many other businesses in the late 1800s, became a big industry. To um, mine out a huge load, like the Comstock load, required a corporation that could buy lots of equipment and hire lots of people, um, providing lots of jobs, but many of them difficult and dangerous. One in 80 miners was killed in their work. It was said that the streets of Butte, Montana, a copper mining town, were paved with Irish bones. And so, in response, miners formed some of the biggest unions of the late 1800s. Um, after a big and violent miners' strike in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, 
um, the Western Federation of Miners was formed um, and would be um, a, a union with a, a reputation for leading violent strikes, more so than, say, the United Mine Workers of America, who represented many Eastern miners. Another problem for miners, too, or rather caused by mining, was that runoff from the mines, um, chemicals dug up or chemicals used to refine the metals, sometimes poisoned the water that farmers and livestock depended on. Because ranching was another important part of life in the West, um, really starting in the 1850s. Um, an area that was often too dry for the type of farming practice farther east, you could still raise cattle um, by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even the millions, left to wander the open range, um, only told apart by the brands burned into the hides of the cattle um, with hot iron. Um, there were no fences, your cattle went where they wanted. And every, every year or so, you rounded them up um, and had them march on the long drive, hundreds, perhaps over a thousand miles, um, from the ranches of West Texas um, to the cow towns along the Transcontinental Railroad, where the cattle could then be sold and shipped further east for slaughter in Chicago. Um, and some cattle trails were up to 1,500 miles long. And cattle were usually encouraged to go about 15 miles a day. Of course, if you went slower, it took longer to get to market. But if you went much faster, and 25 miles a day was about the limit, of course, that caused the cattle to drop weight um, from all that exercise. So you might spend months um, on the trail. And the cow towns and the mining towns were pretty rough places were cowboys and miners who were often just paid um, periodically, cowboys just being paid at the end of the drive, often spent their money uh, in wild living, in the red light districts and the saloons. Um, some describe these wild towns as hell or rottos, places where justice tended to be rough and fast, vigilantes and lynch mobs, sometimes administering justice as much as actual law enforcement. Most of the stories of what we think of as the Wild West are set in cow towns like the Dodge City being one of the most famous. But as mythical as this was, the days of the Wild West were actually fairly brief. It was maybe a generation, at most two, who really worked the open range as cowboys, as we often imagine them. Of course, as railroads spread and meat packing plants were built across the country, Long drives didn't have to be as long. Furthermore, the cattlemen were so successful that there came to be a surplus of beef, um, and beef prices fell. Furthermore, as more and more cattle grazed the Great Plains, um, the grass didn't quite run out, but it became sparse. It took more and more acreage of ranch land to support the same number of cattle. Um, and furthermore, as the railroads brought more settlers west, farmers began to fill up the Great Plains, um, closing off the open range where the cattle had run. The long drive couldn't easily march across the plains anymore. Some um, farmers also took up raising sheep, um, and cattle ranchers hated sheep, because a cow will eat the grass down to the ground, but eventually it will grow back. Sheep, if they are good and hungry, will not just eat the grass down to the ground, they'll pull up the roots and eat those too, um, completely ruining the land. If you have enough grass around, sheep won't do that, but they're desperate, they'll pull up the roots and eat those as well. There's a great deal of resentment between cattle and sheep ranchers, and between cattle ranchers and farmers. And who closed off the Great Plains, um, especially after they began bringing barbed wire to the West? Barbed wire was first patented in 1867, vastly improved in the years to come, in letting farmers keep wandering cattle out of their fields, um, making the long drive much harder. Um, and sometimes ca uh, cattle ranch owners would issue their cowboys um, with wire cutters and tell them just to cut the barbed wire and march the cattle through anyway, which of course the farmers didn't much appreciate. Indeed, range wars broke out in the West as farmers and ranchers um, 
fought with each other over access to land, over access to water, which of course is rare in the, in the Great Plains. Sometimes they fought with miners whose pollution spoiled the water they depended on. Um, <coughs> but the final nail in the coffin of the open range system would be the winter of 1886 to 87, when temperatures fell to negative 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Some cattle froze standing up and stayed froze until April or May. Um, the, um, there wasn't enough grass to feed these flocks or these herds. Perhaps as many as 90% of Western cattle died in this year. And after this, cattle ranches were kept smaller to avoid overgrazing. And as fewer cowboys were needed, um, many were fired. In particular, if you had to fire somebody, you probably fired the black guy first. And so while many cowboys had been African American during the great days of the open range, um, that being one of the few jobs where a black person could be treated more or less equally, when it came time to let someone go, they often let them go first. Although one thing some out-of-work cowboys did was go to California and get involved in the brand new movie industry as stuntmen because they knew how to ride a horse and even how to survive falling off. But it wasn't easy to be a farmer on the Great Plains either. Where wood was scarce, um, they dug up the sod. The soil held together by grass roots had been growing for thousands of years and built houses out of dirt tightly packed together. Some, many had grass growing out of the roots, essentially an igloo um, made of sod. If they were prosperous, they would eventually build a house of, of wood or possibly even brick, but this is how many started off. Um, so some ranchers made fun of them as sod busters. Of course, the sod could be cut thanks to John Deere's invention of a steel plow um, in 1837. Prior to that, it wasn't even possible to plow the fields of the Great Plains. The grass roots were too thick for older styles of plows to cut. Cyrus McCormick's development of the mechanical reaper in the 1840s uh, allowed wheat to be harvested um, in much larger farms. And um, by the late, late 1800s, um, reapers, which cut down the wheat, had been combined with mechanical threshing machines and winnowing machines to separate the wheat from the chaff, or the broken up stock. And um, they called the, these machines combination harvesters, uh, or combines. And as they combined, uh, reaping, threshing, and winnowing. Uh, reaching a point where a single farmer could effectively plant and harvest 135 acres of grain of his own by the late 1800s, and um, in 1911, the first self-propelled combine uh, would be created, making farming truly modern. Right. <coughs> and there were other advances in agricultural science. New types of fertilizers were made, um, some produced completely by chemists, others by ground-up bones, um, others from guano, um, the droppings collected from bats and especially birds. Better methods of irrigation were developed, um, allowing dry land to be planted. New breeds of crops were developed as well. Um, and better seeds were sold through mail order catalogs, making farmers more productive too. And as Western land began to run out, farmers wanted more. So that in 1889, Congress passed the Indian Appropriations Bill making unassigned Indian land part of the public domain and open for settlement, even opening up a large portion of Indian territory promised to the Indians forever um, to public settlement. Officially at noon, April 22, 1889, thousands of settlers lined up at the border for an official bugle to be blown by a government agent and begin the Oklahoma land rush. Although some of them um, rushed into Oklahoma, they found some people had gotten there sooner and claimed land ahead of them. Um, now, I would think that's something to be mad about. Um, Oklahoma kind of takes pride in these Sooners who got there ahead of schedule, and Oklahoma is now known as the Sooner State. The people who went when they were supposed to were known as Boomers, taking advantage of the, of the land boom. And Boomers is also a nickname for Oklahomans.
but farmers face many challenges too. Uh, harsh winters, social isolation, and they were dependent on the railroads to bring in the goods that they needed to survive and especially to ship their products back east. But the railroads, with a captive market, um, took advantage of this as railroad cartels, um, through pooling or price fixing, um, kept prices high. Farmers needed the railroads, but they hated them, feeling abused and cheated by them. Likewise, all that new farm equipment, all those new fertilizers, all those improved types of seeds were very expensive. And many farmers in the West, just like sharecroppers in the South, ended up in a cycle of debt, borrowing money at the beginning of the year um, to pay for supplies, um, borrowing money to live through the year, and hopefully paying it back at the end, but maybe not, um, if the harvest failed. Or, of course, if too many harvests were too successful, growing more and more crops led to falling crop prices. The more bushels of wheat you produce, the less each bushel is worth. And so, by the late 1880s and the early 1890s, many farmers were growing desperate. <coughs> and, according to Frederick Jackson Turner, this is due to the end of a great historical era. He began the significance of the frontier in American history with an announcement from a recent bulletin from the superintendent of the census for 1890 declaring that so many people had moved west, they had filled up the continent. You could no longer draw a line and say west of here um, is unsettled land. There were pockets of unsettled land, not counting Indians, but there was no longer a frontier. The west was no longer an escape or a safety valve. Still, and Turner believed that was a real issue of concern for the United States. Nonetheless, the West, in the desperation of its people, would still redefine American democracy one more time in the years to come. 